Hi everyone, welcome to our digital health speaker series uh, for the month. Uh, before we start, a few housekeeping issues. So please be aware that our luncheons are webcast and recorded and will be on the website. Uh, so this, this event is part of uh, a digital health at Harvard, which is co-sponsored by the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, Bioethics, and Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, which is right across the street. Uh, I myself is a Shvina Gadjali. I manage a project called Global Access in Action, which promotes access to medicine uh, and located within the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, and it's really interesting to, and, and I'm happy to have all of you here today. Uh, so if you're interested to be part of this conversation uh, on health tech, please do follow us or email us or grab hold of myself or the teams who are here. Uh, we would be happy to enroll you on our listserv, but also to have you part of a working group uh, which would be look, looking at specific uh, issues over the next year. Uh, and one last thing, we are happy if you tweet on this uh, specific uh, luncheon series or if you tweet on, and I hope Mark doesn't mind as well, uh, if you tag him as well. Uh, so do make sure that you relay the conversation that's happening today or your own perspective of the discussion. Uh, so it is my pleasure now to welcome Mark Lipsich from the School of Public Health. Uh, this is a long outstanding uh, invitation and I'm very happy that he's finally here. So Mark is a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health uh, with a joint appointment at the Department of Immunology and Infectious Disease and the Department of Epidemiology. He also directs the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics uh, and is the Associate Director of the Interdisciplinary Concentration in Infectious Disease Epidemiology. His research concerns the effect of naturally acquired host immunity, vaccine-induced immunity, and other public health interventions. Uh, on population biology of pathogens and the consequences of changing pathogen population for human health. Uh, today, specifically, he's going to talk about his work on computer simulation uh, on how to enhance vaccine trials, which I know is of uh, interest to many of us in the room. So without further delay, Mark, uh, welcome. Thank you, Ash, and thanks to all of you for coming, and, and to Berkman Klein and Petrie Flom for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here. It's a very different crowd from people I usually talk to, and I, I will say I am not quite sure what will be of greatest interest uh, to this crowd. So a few points of framing. Um, one is to say this talk has had various titles. I was told it was too long, and so I shortened it. Um, this is the shorter title. Um, there is, the previous one had some more kind of ethics and policy f aspect to it, which I'll talk about a little bit, but I will focus on the, on the computational part. Um, the other thing to say is that uh, I've constructed the talk uh, to account for this uncertainty to some extent um, by making it somewhat modular. I have sort of three main sections after the introduction. I'm happy to skip the third one. I think it's more technically interesting, but less, maybe less conceptually interesting uh, for some of you. Um, and so depending on where the discussion goes, please ask questions along the way, make comments along the way, and uh, I will adjust as the time permits and the interest permits. Um, and the last thing to say is that uh, I have I've put this together at a fairly high level of abstraction. There are not a lot of details of the methods. Uh, I can provide those if people are interested, um, but, but I thought I would go broader rather than deeper mostly because I don't know what will particularly strike a chord, but I'm happy to get deeper if someone uh, is interested. So with all of that as prelude, um, the, the goal that I want to talk about means towards is the goal of providing safe, effective vaccines to those who need them and doing so fast. I'm going to focus most of the talk on uh, the first two examples on uh, mostly the setting of emergencies uh, where, uh, where there's a real source of uh, urgency, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so fast is especially important in outbreak diseases. Um, 
And this is kind of the pipeline, very simplified, of how vaccines uh, get to people, uh, starting from basic research uh, on the me mechanisms of, of uh, the pathogen and its pathogenesis, um, working through uh, development of candidate vaccines, testing in animals, uh, then uh, that's all the preclinical phases. Then the first clinical phase is, is tests of the safety of the vaccines, uh, of the candidate vaccines, uh, and their immunogenicity or ability to elicit uh, a, a response that might be protective uh, against future infections. And then uh, efficacy or effectiveness trials to see whether they actually protect people uh, against infection. And then when those are successful, licensure and deployment. Um, all of the uh, all of the steps up to um, safety and immunogenicity trials can be done in principle before uh, there is any disease present. You can do uh, you can you can test in animals by giving them the disease. You can uh, you can test safety and immunogenicity in people without uh, without having the disease present, and then. Uh, the last two phases really require that the disease be present, which is a particular challenge for diseases that are only sporadically present or sporadically detected. And so in 2014, with the uh, outbreak of Ebola in West Africa, we were actually stuck at an earlier phase. We, we had, because of biodefense interest, on the shelf uh, several candidate vaccines at different phases of um, of preclinical testing up through animal testing, but very little human data on these. These have not been tested in humans uh, to a large extent, even for those things which you could do in principle uh, without the disease being present. And uh, <clears throat> for many potential threats, we're at, at even earlier phases uh, for the diseases that uh, we fear might cause outbreaks or, or larger um, epidemics or pandemics um, were at even earlier phases and even animal testing hasn't happened. And many of you are very familiar with uh, this development that a couple of years ago, uh, an organization called CEPI, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations was set up um, with about a, a billion dollars aspirationally and much of that actually, uh, actually pledged from foundations and governments, and it was established to do two things. One was to move candidate vaccines um, against anticipated threats, so known potential threats, known, known pathogens that might be outbreak threats um, through testing for, uh, through the last stage that you can do before the disease is actually present. And then secondly, to establish platform technologies to rapidly produce vaccines against unanticipated threats. Um, which is to say viruses or other pathogens that we have never seen or that we imagine like Zika a few, until a few years ago uh, to be mild and unimportant uh, causes of, uh, of disease that we would never care to, to make a vaccine against. <clears throat> so the idea is to, uh, to move from here uh, through the efforts of CEPI and, and others, but really led by CEPI, uh, up to here for as many potential threats as we can think of, plus platforms uh, for those that we can't think of. And I mentioned that, uh, that for um, outbreak-prone diseases like Ebola in, in those three countries, there's a sense of urgency. And the sense of urgency really kind of has two parts, uh, which all feel very urgent, but they feel urgent for different reasons. So this is an epidemic curve of the virus, uh, of the cases in two countries, two of the three affected countries. And it's labeled on the left uh, with the sources of urgency during the, the increasing phase of the epidemic. So there's near exponential growth of the epidemic. There's a, a feeling that we need countermeasures uh, to mitigate this accelerating epidemic. Uh, 
Um, and incidence is typically very patchy in space, which makes it very hard to figure out where, if we're going to test some, some countermeasure, where are we going to do it? And infrastructure is not typically very uh, thick on the ground in places where this might be needed. So you have to set up the infrastructure in anticipation of using it. But where to do that is, is not obvious. For coming to the maximum with other diseases such as influenza, polio, and uh, other other things, is, is this <coughs> how, do, how does this compare to, to the uh, graph you would show for other diseases? Mark, I'm sorry, would you mind to repeat that question? Sure. The question is, how typical is this time scale of about a year from uh, from initiation to peak? Um, it, there's no reason why it should be typical, uh, but it's not a bad guess at the time scale. So influenza is not new, so we anticipate it, and we'll, it'll be back again next year. Um, so in some sense, it's it's not the same the same type of urgency. But influenza uh, does typically rise over a couple of months and fall over a couple of months. Pandemics are a little bit different um, and can be multi-peaked. Um, Polio is kind of dribbling along and, and being pushed towards eradication uh, with periodic upsurges, um, but there's no need for a new vaccine to be tested. So for, for these kinds of outbreak-prone diseases, uh, it really depends on the natural history of the disease um, and on how seasonal the transmission is. So there's no real rule about it, but, but uh, epidemics of any size typically take at least several months to get going, uh, just because most things don't transmit ultra fast. The other question is, how much does this, how much does this depend on communication patterns? For example, plague during the Middle Ages would uh, spread based on communication uh, patterns and things like that over a period of years. Is this within one geographical area, or is this worldwide? Um, so the, again, it's very disease specific. Most of the diseases that, that we can worry about outbreaks of transmit through close contact. So locally, people are around people and, and you can get a rapid exponential growth at some rate that's not so determined by, by global transmission or global movement patterns. At the next level, up, though, as you begin to look outside of a local area, then the degree of connectedness matters a lot. Um, so, so the early part of this could have happened in any century, but the and and the and the connections were not so great uh, in these countries. But um, but the big worry during this early phase, for example, was that it would get into Lagos. Uh, Nigeria, because it had crossed the it did cross the border into Nigeria and was fortunately contained very quickly. So, had it gotten into a big city, uh, then the potential uh, would have been to infect a large portion of that city. So, it, it, I guess the key point is that most connections between people are local, but that that can saturate if if there aren't also longer distance connections, and and it depends on how fast it can get out of that area. But these were, uh, it, most of the parts of most of all three of these countries were affected. Bordering countries were affected, but, uh, but in particular, Nigeria contained it uh, very quickly. <clears throat> so there was this feeling of urgency, uh, and, and at the, in 2014, public health experts were saying we may not be able to contain this without a vaccine. And so that was, and we're projecting very, very large numbers. Um, and so that was a real incentive to try to get a vaccine going. Um, fortunately, they were wrong uh, in about that pessimistic prediction. Um, and it did begin to turn over uh, around the end of 2014. Of course, you never know when it's turning over and when it's just a temporary downturn until, until it's really turned over. So at the time, you don't know what to say, but, you, uh, but at least uh, it was beginning to turn over. And then by 2015, it was, uh, it was declining fairly dramatically due to basic public health measures, changes in burial practices, uh, 
um, uh, changes in movement, uh, restriction of movement, and all sorts of other things uh, to, your, to your question. So then the challenge is, if we don't test this vaccine now, we may have no cases, not enough cases around to test it until the next outbreak. And so we'll be in the same position we were in uh, back at the beginning of 2014, but in the next outbreak, which is, uh, whose timing is unpredictable. So the, the end game was a big rush to try to figure out, can we, um, can we uh, test a vaccine? Maybe not for the purposes of ending it, this outbreak, but for the purposes of having something next time. And of course, that vaccine was tested, that was tested uh, has been used in subsequent, uh, subsequently in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there is an ongoing uh, outbreak of, of uh, Ebola virus disease complicated by uh, conflict and uh, unsafe conditions for the medical workers, as well as the, as well as the residents. <clears throat> so, spurred on by this experience and a little bit of uh, 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 participation um, in that Ebola trial as a member of the advisory group to the Ebola vaccine trial, uh, we've begun to develop a research agenda that basically consists of trying to figure out ways of doing uh, new approaches to, to these uh, clinical trials of vaccines. Um, and understanding the properties of the existing ones as they would be implemented in emergencies. Um, secondly, uh, and this was the part that fell out of the title when I shortened it, uh, and I'll just mention a little bit, is I think there's a big, so far has been a big disconnect between the ethical debate and the, uh, and the methodological debate, uh, which has often pitted methodologists against ethicists as, as statisticians saying you can only get answers from a very pure trial and ethicists saying that's using people as guinea pigs and uh, a lot of not very productive discussion. Um, and there are various reasons for that, but I think bringing some of these quantitative understandings into the ethical discussion uh, can only sharpen it. Uh, and that's something we've begun to do uh, in work that I'll just briefly mention. <clears throat> and we've talked about, uh, but haven't yet begun, uh, WHO has actually begun this in a way um, to try to compile what we know at the moment into a, a sort of playbook that uh, allows people to think about trial designs in advance uh, and in a systematic way. And ideally that would be dynamic and updatable so as the technology for, for by which I mean that the techniques for developing these trials improve, uh, they can be incorporated. And uh, last year with Nir Eyal, who's a bioethicist, uh, we had a paper in science uh, that, that tried to look, in, look at some of these issues. But, but what I want to talk about today is kind of a subset of that, which is, uh, which is an idea that a number of people have had, and we had a little meeting about it uh, a couple of years ago in Seattle, um, which is the idea that simulations, computer simulations, are part of the, uh, of the toolkit for improving our vaccine trials. In other words, simulating the trial can be part of the process of planning it uh, and both the design and the analysis of, of that trial. Um, and in, in different audiences, I have a long discourse on why that should be necessary because that hasn't been done very much in the past. But the summary of that is that with standard clinical trials of non-communicable uh, outcomes like heart attacks or, or uh, strokes or whatever, um, the theory is pretty well understood for how you design uh, a trial and it's, you can write down elegant equations and, and there's very little need to simulate it. Similarly, for very simple uh, vaccine trials, um, that can often be the case, you can just use basic theory that you learn in, in clinical trials uh, classes and there's not much need to simulate it. The real reason to try to, to bring computational approaches in is really when the existence of the trial itself is interfering with the disease transmission process, uh, hopefully by reducing it, uh, which is good for the people in the trial and bad for the power of the trial because more cases mean you can study something better. Uh, so if the existence of the trial itself is changing the process of transmission, then the assumptions that go into standard methods are no longer really valid. 
and sometimes it's useful to, to um, write down and execute simulations of the trial. And I say write down because in my experience doing this so far, uh, actually the, the process of just trying to say what are all the steps that will happen in a trial when you have transmission and where the individual cases are the sources of other cases, just that process of writing down the code or even a sort of box diagram for the code uh, is as informative and generates probably the more important insights than running the code itself. Um, so it's, it's really a matter of formalizing your thought process as much as it is of computing uh, complicated numbers. <clears throat> so an example of that is the ring vaccination trial that was used for the uh, Ebola vaccine in Guinea. This was the Merck manufactured uh, RVSV um, vaccine. And uh, it's the one on which I served on the technical advisory board and that in, in thereby got interested in trying to think about what could go wrong, what are the, what are the potential pitfalls of this trial, uh, how can I provide helpful advice, some of which was more appreciated than others. But, um, but the, what was extraordinary about this trial was that the, essentially the, the technique was invented on the fly. Ring vaccination had been used as a way of controlling smallpox. And ring vaccination simply means you find cases and around those cases you vaccinate people. And exactly what you mean by around can vary by the situation, but you, you target your vaccination around cases in order to sort of prevent, pr produce fire breaks around those cases. So for known useful vaccines like the smallpox vaccine, this was a well-established uh, approach, but it had never been used as a trial method. In other words, there was, it had never been used to try to figure out, does this vaccine do anything at all uh, beneficial or, or is it uh, useless? Which is what a phase three um, uh, efficacy trial is supposed to do. <clears throat> so what was extraordinary was that a team of people invented this as a, as a means of evaluating vaccines on the fly and created the trial and ran the trial all during that chaotic period that I showed the curve of a minute ago. <clears throat> and the basic design was to find cases to, uh, to then create a ring around each of those cases defined as the contacts of those cases and the contacts of their contacts. Then once that ring was identified to randomize the ring to be either, uh, to receive either vaccination as soon as possible or vaccination three weeks later. Um, and to compare the rings that had been vaccinated immediately to those that had been vaccinated with a delay with the expectation that an effective vaccine would produce lower incidence in the rings uh, that were immediately vaccinated and higher incidence in the rings that were uh, delayed. Um, and so these were two of, the, two of the papers, the first two papers that came out on, on that trial. Um, and our goal was a little bit to think about that trial, but by the time we were, we were doing simulations, we were really trying to address a more general question, which is uh, people were saying once this trial proved to be uh, effective in testing the vaccine, or reasonably effective in testing it, it wasn't perfect, uh, that this might be the new standard for how we try uh, test vaccines in emergencies. And so we wanted to try to ask the question, is what what are the conditions under which is, this is a good design? And this is the paper uh, that was a, a, a part of the doctoral thesis of Matt Hitchings uh, and done in, <coughs> in collaboration with Rebecca Grace of Epicentre, which is the, um, the Médecins Sans Frontières uh, Research Center in Paris. So, so to do this, we abstract from the reality and we create a model of the disease dynamics. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about how we did that. We, we assumed that there was a small homogeneous ring of people uh, <coughs> with uh, of about 50 people typically around a case. Uh, and we used uh, what's known as an SEIR or susceptible exposed infectious and recovered uh, 
um, compartmental model, which is just tracks the stage of illness or infection for, for the people in the ring. Um, we've allowed people to be vaccinated at a certain time, and we also allowed people to be, uh, to be hospitalized at a certain time, which meant that they were detected with their symptoms and their uh, symptoms and, and thereby isolated and put in the hospital. Um, and, uh, and that was the basic pieces of the model. This is a graphical picture of it. Um, I guess all pictures are graphical. This is a picture of it. Um, and the, <clears throat> the, when I say that writing down this model was actually the, one of the biggest sources of insight, what I mean by that is when you write down a model and you have compartments that somebody has to always be in one, exactly one of, so they're either susceptible or they're susceptible and vaccinated or they're exposed, meaning they've become infected but are not yet sick, or they're infectious and infected, uh, infectious and symptomatic, or they're hospitalized or they're recovered or dead, <coughs> which is not shown here. Um, the, you have to figure out where do people go and how do they, how do they contribute to the, uh, to the infectious process. And in the process of doing that, it occurred to me that once somebody's hospitalized, they should be isolated and no longer contributing to transmission. Uh, and in a well-run trial, that should certainly be the case. But it, it then occurred to me, and I'll show this as one of the results, that, uh, that the faster you detect your cases, the better your trial is set up to detect the outcome it's supposed to detect, the fewer cases you're gonna get because these people are no longer contributing to transmission. So a very well-functioning trial in one sense is gonna, it risks being an underpowered trial in another sense because every time you ascertain a case, you make them no longer a source of infection. Um, and that's an example of the kind of thing that doesn't go into standard power calculations for a trial, but could be potentially very important. So we simulated uh, this trial, um, and I, I won't go through all these um, bullet points. That basically says what I just mentioned. <coughs> um, and we estimated the incidence rates in, in each of these rings and then use that to estimate how many rings would we need in order to be able to tell that the vaccine was effective, assuming that it was effective uh, with a certain level of, of effect. Um, and so <clears throat> when you run this computer simulation, uh, which is quite straightforward to do, what you find is that the incidence rate uh, in rings that are immediately vaccinated uh, goes up right after they're vaccinated because the vaccine takes time to, to take effect and also because people have already been infected uh, at the time you vaccinate them, some of them, and so you, but they aren't yet sick. And so those people, by assumption, the vaccine doesn't help with. So you start, you start with an increase in the, in the number of cases uh, per capita, but that starts to decline and it declines, uh, especially in the group that got immediately vaccinated because the contacts of the people uh, who were transmitting during that vaccination campaign are now protected uh, after a certain delay. And then in the, uh, in the uh, delayed arm, this whole process is postponed by about, uh, about um, the, by about the amount of time that they're delayed. <clears throat> so, so the idea is then you create the, this trial, you run it uh, with the size that your, your calculations tell you you need in order to get a, uh, a high probability of seeing a, a, a statistically significant result if there is a, a real uh, protective efficacy. And by assumption in this, uh, in this simulation, the effect of the vaccine was to be 75% protective. 75 or 70? 70% 70 protective. Uh, in our base case, which is shown in red. And what this shows is that, uh, what this left graph shows is that the 
efficacy that you measure varies. It goes up if you have a more effective vaccine, and it goes down if you have a less effective vaccine. But it doesn't do that linearly. And so if you have a 100% effective vaccine, you, you find about 80% benefit. If you have a 50% effective vaccine, you find about 60%, almost 55% effective. <clears throat> and the, uh, the reasons for that are things that come out of, of then analyzing the results. You get this attenuation because some people who were protected uh, get their disease, uh, sorry, some people, the, the period of observation that you use to decide whether someone uh, is a case or not has to be defined based on the, the period of time before someone gets symptoms and, uh, and the time that the vaccine takes to, to uh, confer protection, but that varies from person to person. So you misclassify some people uh, uh, and that attenuates your efficacy. Uh, on, the, on the other side, <clears throat> you're not just measuring the effect of the vaccine on the person who gets it, but also the effect of the vaccine in all the, that person's contacts in the ring on them. And so you get some of the indirect benefits measured in this, uh, in this way. When you, when you set the vaccine efficacy to 70%, as it happens, what comes out is exactly 70% on average with some variation between, between runs. But, uh, but looking at other parameter values shows you that that's kind of a coincidence that where these two effects just happen to balance. And then you can also use this for trying to figure out how many sample, how many rings you need to sample. And <clears throat> as you would expect, the more effective the vaccine is, the easier it is to see that effect and the fewer rings you need to do it. <clears throat> And then you can ask about some of the other parameters. And I mentioned this probability of uh, detection. Uh, so a well-run trial will have a very high probability that if someone is a case, they'll be detected and detected fast. And a well-functioning public health system will isolate that person as quickly as possible. So uh, when you have a, uh, when you, have a daily probability of detection, and these numbers are, are kind of uh, just guessed at as being reasonable because because uh, those were not reported in the trial. But if you if it takes on average five days, so it's a twenty percent chance uh, per day of being uh, that cases are detected, then you get this estimate of efficacy that's about seventy percent. If you uh, if you detect less well, you're actually able to see more efficacy because you see more uh, in cases and those uh, cases are better prevented uh, by the vaccine um, due to its indirect effects. And if you do very good case detection, it actually makes the vaccine look a little bit worse. So it's a case where one aspect of good trial running leads to uh, attenuation of the, of the effect, uh, of the observed effect. And <clears throat> the daily probability of detection also has uh, strange effects on the sample size that's required. Again, because if you shut down transmission by detecting cases well, uh, then you need to have a lot more rings to get the same number of cases to see an effect. So these are the kinds of trade-offs, and we can play these games with, uh, with other parameters. And, and maybe since this is, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just, um, skip through some of that because um, I'm talking more than I anticipated on each slide. So um, I'll summarize the, the findings from this that um, the sample size and the estimate are sensitive to various parameters of how you run the trial, of how the rings are set up, um, and of, uh, of the proportion of infections that come from outside the ring. So the premise of designing a trial like this is that most infections come from within the ring, um, and that's why setting up your trial around a case is actually an effective thing to do. But, uh, but if you deviate from that, it actually becomes easier to do the trial in some sense because you're not interfering with the transmission by doing the vaccination itself. 
so there's actually more uh, more transmission to to stop. <coughs> um, so so the purpose of doing all of this is is to really ask the question, all right, is this the best trial design for all settings? Probably not. Uh, it, it's clearly a good trial to design in the setting where, epi where transmission is local and uh, very uh, focused um, and also declining so that you really need to focus your, your efforts right around cases because otherwise uh, you'll, you'll need to vaccinate way too many people. But uh, so those, those are the settings in which a design like this could be uh, could be well uh, suited. It doesn't measure the quantity that it purports to measure, uh, notwithstanding the way it was described in the publications. It measures a composite of the eff efficacy on the person who was being vaccinated and the, uh, and the indirect protection of, uh, of their contacts. Um, and efficient case detection turns out to be a double-edged sword. It's obviously good for the person, for the individuals. It's also good for knowing that you have cases, which is important for the trial. But it also uh, shut. On the other hand, it shuts down some of the transmission. Um, and so the idea of having a, a simulation machine like this, which is just a short bit of R code, actually, is not not very complicated is that if you have a new disease and you want to run a trial like this uh, in a different population with different sizes of rings or different sizes of, of um, or different types of natural history, you can very lightly modify it and, uh, and ask these same questions and try to see what would, the, what would the predictions be. So it's a design tool. Second example, I want to talk about is, is work uh, that, that uh, Rebecca Kahn, now a PhD student, did as part of her master's thesis and, and just was published. And the question there is, what if you have asymptomatic infections in a vaccine trial? Um, and you might think, well, who cares? If you have an asymptomatic infection, maybe we don't care about preventing it. Maybe it's not that interesting. But in fact, it turns out that almost all of the big, uh, big uh, infections on the CEPI list, including Zika, well, Zika's not on their list, but, but uh, Nipah, Lhasa, uh, arguably Ebola, um, and, and a number of others, have a proportion of infections that are asymptomatic or subclinical. So you would be very hard pressed to detect them uh, without very uh, intensive um, surveillance, and even with very intensive surveillance, uh, probably you would miss a number of infections without, uh, unless you tested people for antibodies after the fact. <clears throat> um, but these infections can be important for at least two reasons. One is they can serve as sources of transmission to others. And second is that they can have uh, sequelae, such as Gambare syndrome for Zika. So you can have a Zika infection that does nothing that you can detect at the moment, but that leaves you with a neurological uh, syndrome afterwards, uh, some time afterwards. Um, and so preventing that as previously asymptomatic case would have been important. Um, so we would like to measure efficacy against that. And standard approaches uh, don't work. And I think the easiest way <clears throat> to see this is with a diagram. So in a vaccine trial, you're studying people. Some of them are at risk. Uh, say you have whatever that number of circles that is, about 10 people in the vaccine arm and 10 people in the control arm. And a proportion of them get infected, but a smaller proportion in the vaccine arm because you have uh, uh, an effective vaccine. So. If that's true, then the people at risk will be the ones in pink. There are uh, fewer people at risk in the uh, control arm because they've already been infected. But what you observe, if, there are, if some of those are asymptomatic, is that a few of those people have symptomatic infections. And what you think, if you don't know that there are asymptomatic infections, is that there are uh, a lot more people at risk. And especially 
if you compare here the, the people you think are at risk in the control arm to the ones who are actually at risk, you've gotten it very wrong. Whereas in the vaccine arm, you've gotten it less wrong because most people haven't gotten infected. Your vaccine protected most of them. So you've, you've overestimated the number of people at risk, especially in the, uh, in the arm that got control. And when you do that, <clears throat> you get an estimate of how well the vaccine did that is biased towards being ineffective. It, it, it biases your estimate towards the estimate that the vaccine didn't do anything because you think there are all these people at risk uh, and most of them aren't getting infected yet anymore in the control arm because they were already infected. You just didn't see it. And this is a pretty well-known problem. Um, but what hadn't been done was to try to figure out how to solve it. So one way you could solve it would be uh, you just test people uh, every week to detect asymptomatic infections. And you could do that by testing for the virus if you did it very intensively, or by testing for antibodies to the virus, uh, which persists so you can be a little bit more, uh, um, you, you don't have to do it as frequently. But these are challenging because they're expensive. The serology, the, the antibody tests are not very good, especially for something like Zika. Uh, it's often hard to tell whether they had the vaccine or the, or the infection. There are a bunch of challenges. So <clears throat> what we wondered was, can we test, can we figure out a way to test people efficiently? For example, only test people in some of the, of the study and use what you learn about them to inform estimates for the other people. And you do that by a technique called imputation, which I won't dwell on. So again, what we did to test these ideas was to simulate a trial. Uh, we simulated uh, with various levels of transmission, uh, various trial lengths. Um, these are the base case numbers, but we tried various uh, variations on these. And, and what we did to, to just focus on was initially to look at a vaccine that was 60% effective against all infections, and people who were infected were equally likely to be symptomatic if they were vaccinated or not, but they were just less likely to become infected. <clears throat> and so these are the results. The results are that if you could have perfect knowledge, so test people essentially continuously, have a, have a port in their arm, and if, as soon as the virus got to them, uh, you would know it, uh, then you get the right answer, which, is, which we've labeled impractical. Uh, <clears throat> You can, with low effort, the, the, the labels on here uh, refer to the level of effort. With low effort, uh, if you just note the symptomatic people um, and do various analyses uh, that, that you could do with just the symptomatic infections, you get an underestimate. You think the vaccine is about 42, 45% effective, but it's actually 60% effective. And then there are various uh, ways if you test people at the end of the trial, uh, either at the end of the trial or, uh, or three times, end, beginning, middle, and end, um, you can, uh, with considerable effort, uh, meaning you're testing every individual in the trial, you can get essentially the right answer. But what was uh, the main contribution of this, this work was to show that if you test only 10% of the people in the trial, and then you use those people to, the results from those people to figure out what is the ratio of symptomatic to asymptomatic cases, and extrapolate that through imputation to the other people in the trial, you can get, uh, you can get the right answer with essentially far fewer resources than it would take to test everyone in the trial. <clears throat> so, that's a, a shorter example, but, but here the idea is really it doesn't so much matter what kind of trial you're doing. The point is that there are ways of economizing on, on the tests, which are expensive uh, to do accurately, um, and you can, you can nonetheless get the right answer to figure out if your vaccine is working. So in the last couple of minutes before uh, opening up for discussion, I just want to mention uh, a 
couple of uh, sort of ongoing areas and uh, some questions that we're thinking about, uh, and maybe these will spark some discussion. So I mentioned I think there's a connection between these questions of quantitative ish of quantitating uh, vaccine how vaccine trials work and uh, and research ethics and. Um, We've begun to explore those mostly, we being mostly Nir Eyal and I and uh, Rebecca Khan, the, the student who's, who's become interested in the ethical issues as well, and Annette Ridd, uh, another bioethicist. Um, and we've been trying to think about questions like, are randomized trials needed in emergencies? Uh, are they ethical even if you want to use placebo? And can we use them to maximize public health benefit uh, in case the, the uh, vaccine proves effective? And this is, there are various thoughts, ideas about this. Uh, another interesting um, project that I was not involved in, uh, but now collaborate with some of these people, um, was a, a, a study by Guy Harling and colleagues that tried to figure out uh, designs that were, where that was an explicit goal. But we, we actually took a more simple view and just <clears throat> pointed out that uh, when you do an individually randomized trial, which some people have ethical concerns about, uh, one of the benefits of doing that is that it happens faster. Uh, you get the answer faster than you would in a cluster randomized trial, such as a step wedge trial, which is one where you roll it out, roll out the vaccine to different communities uh, in some randomized order and compare the incidence in vaccinated communities to ones that have not yet gotten the vaccine. Some people prefer this, this upper one because it's, it gives everybody the vaccine. So I don't know how to classify this as ethics or just sort of common sense or, or quantitative or what, but, but, but what we pointed out was that if you're really anxious to give everyone the vaccine as soon as possible because you imagine that it's likely to, to be beneficial, then doing an individually randomized trial and then immediately giving the vaccine to, uh, to those in the control arm still allows you to vaccinate everyone, and in, in particular the least advantaged, if you have equity uh, considerations, the least advantaged who get it last get it earlier in this setting than they would in the setting of this, uh, what some people consider to be an ethically preferable uh, uh, study design. So we, we think that by being a little bit creative in terms of the, uh, the way you set up the trial, you can address many of the ethical concerns. <clears throat> Another sort of broad policy question, which I would love to think harder about and just have not really had time to, to focus on, um, but maybe will be in the interests of some of the people here. Excuse me. Uh, is are there circumstances where we would forgo randomized trials to test whether a vaccine works uh, because rolling out a vaccine is so urgent? Um, and I think we start with a strong presumption in favor of requiring that we test vaccines as we do for all ordinary vaccines before we roll them out. There are economic reasons to do that. Nobody wants to make a vaccine that they, in large quantity, that they can't be sure is actually any good. There are regulatory reasons the FDA exists to make sure this kind of thing happens, uh, among other reasons. There are ethical reasons giving people an unproven vaccine is, is uh, arguably not a good thing. Um, and there are historic reasons in that there are examples of really promising looking vaccines that actually did harm uh, when they were used in eth efficacy trials. Those were not licensed. Those are not the vaccines that we use now. Those are vaccines that were appropriately stopped by the regulatory or the clinical trials process. But you could imagine a scenario of a very, very fast moving, very deadly disease where uh, it was so dire that some kind of observational rollout uh, rather than a trial could be desirable. Um, and I think it would be valuable to have those conversations uh, and discussions before uh, such a thing happens. Um, so if people are interested in that, I'd be happy to discuss further. And then the last area that I'll mention that we uh, are working on that's, uh, that's now Rebecca Kahn's main um, research area is to try to incorporate pathogen sequence data into vaccine trials where you can estimate who affected whom, who infected whom, and thereby enhance the inference of what the vaccine has done. Uh, 
So most of the time when you do a trial, you know if someone was vaccinated and whether they got infected, but you don't know if they infected anybody else or who infected the people that did get infected. With pathogen DNA or RNA sequences, you can esti make estimates of who infected whom, and therefore you can tell how infectious someone was as well as whether they were, uh, as well as how, uh, how susceptible they were, and tell what the vaccine did to that. So uh, what we're doing now with a, with a grant from, maybe a grant that's been, it started in April and we haven't gotten the money yet, so hopefully a grant from the, um, from the UK government is to uh, try to figure out how you can enhance trials in that way. So just to close, uh, I think simulations can aid in the design uh, and analysis of trials for infectious diseases. Uh, we think it's really valuable to do this work and studying these properties of these designs before uh, the emergency comes. Uh, as I briefly talked about, I think the ethics are really entangled with the methodology and we should try to discuss both of these during peacetime uh, between epidemics. Um, uh, I think ring vaccination is a promising design for the end of an epidemic, but with some caveats that I discussed. Um, and uh, we think we've found a way to study efficacy against asymptomatic infections in a way that is uh, economically feasible uh, or more feasible. And so I will skip the last example as I promised. He didn't get a choice. I just skipped it. Um, and just end with uh, a list of collaborators and thank you for your attention and take questions. So we have about 15 minutes for question. Um, are there any burning question or can I have used my moderator prerogative to, to start the discussion? There's one over there. Someone? Sure. Early on, you were talking about um, hospitals as isolation mechanisms. Uh, how realistic is that, and how necessary is that to your analysis? If if hospitals weren't, uh, yeah. So, if they if they weren't, uh, you could imagine two things, two possibilities. One is they don't change your risk of infecting others, which would be kind of odd because. It's a big behavioral change. And the other is that they increase it. And so, for example, in the, <clears throat> the outbreaks of MERS in both the Middle East and, uh, and especially in South Korea have been largely focused in hospitals. So the hospital is itself the venue for transmission. So, and so that has actually encouraged us to think about, are there trial designs for something like a MERS vaccine that would use that fact that it seems like uh, hospitals are are the settings where the transmission is most likely. So it's not that we're positing this as a universal fact. It was a reasonably reasonable approximation of a fact at that stage of the Ebola outbreak. Um, not at all stages because in places that used, uh, that had funeral rituals that involved washing the body and touching the body, you know, the hospital was not the end of the story. There was still an opportunity for transmission afterwards. So it's not, we don't mean that as a, as a sort of f assumed fact about everything. It's just that in this case, it probably was. And, uh, and if the trial was working well, it was. So talking about the Ebola, right now we are starting to test the multidrugs in DRC. And I was wondering whether, how does the, the ring vaccination apply in that particular context, given what we know now in DRC, and the fact that you mentioned the ethics as well, I think it's a, it's a good case study. Is this something <coughs> that would be applicable? Yeah, um, I probably not in the sense that the drugs, at least for the moment, the purpose of the drugs is not to affect transmission, but to affect clinical course. So you can't really give them until you have a case, and then you give them to the case, not to the contacts. You could imagine testing drugs prophylactically, but, but probably way down the line, uh, and probably not anytime soon. Um, I do think that the ethical questions that come up 
are very closely related, uh, especially the question of whether to use placebo or some, some sim something similar to placebo. Um, and there's a kind of simmering debate about that in the literature. Um, and whether vac so we've really limited our focus to vaccines because I think the, in, the issues are more clear cut in vaccines and it's better to solve easy problems first and then hard ones. But, uh, but I think some of what's been written recently, for example, by Alex London on the ethics of, of unproven interventions, I think applies equally well to vaccine, I mean, to, to drugs, to treatments, um, and that there's uh, a good case to be made that, that some, stan some standard of care plus placebo or, or standard of care um, that does not include the experimental um, drugs is what you should use as a comparator. Um, but that would be controversial with many people. Although I think that argument is starting to hold some sway. Any more questions? A few, a few weeks ago, uh, Harvard had this special week on contagion where they were talking about <coughs> outbreaks of new diseases. How realistic is, how applicable is this kind of study to planning for something like that? Um, I think many of the th things they were talking about were things like Ebola and Zika. Uh, it was more focused on flu, but, but I think um, the only way that any disease gets to be global is that we fail to contain it locally. No diseases sort of pop up in many places at once spontaneously because they're transmitted by infectious agents. Um, and I've tried to make the case uh, in a number of ways that dealing with something like Ebola, an Ebola outbreak or a Zika outbreak is at the small level is the way to, to prevent large scale catastrophes. It is true that the chance that Ebola becomes global without barring some biological change in the virus is not very great because because we can handle it in resource rich places and um, or, or barring a massive attack in which it was distributed to lots of people simultaneously. But a trickle of cases is something we can handle if Chris Christie and his friends would get out of the way. Um, but, but putting aside uh, um, politics, we can handle a trickle of cases, which is how it would begin um, in, in rich countries. The respiratory transmitted viruses like, like uh, influenza and um, the, some of the coronaviruses are of greater concern because they are it's much harder to prevent transmission. Um, and so, but those two start small and get bigger. Uh, so I think, I think finding ways to contain smallish outbreaks is by, by vaccines or other, other things, other measures is the way to, is a way to prevent large scale outbreaks. Um, influenza is a special case in that it will travel very, very fast and will be in many places at once. But, uh, but with that exception, there really aren't a lot of cases where, where you get beyond this phase very quickly. Now, does that answer your question? Well, one of the worries that some people have been speculating about lately <clears throat> is some kind of bioterrorism, a manufactured synthetic new disease where some of the characteristics of the uh, Marburg type diseases are combined with some of the transmission capabilities of the respiratory diseases and how the ability to react quickly to that. Uh, it's also communication patterns. A lot of the isolation mechanisms in traditional societies, for example, in Africa, the villages would just block the pathways to isolate themselves in epidemics in the past, whereas if something materialized, let's say, during some kind of emergency in a large city, it would be 
much more difficult yeah. to contain quickly. Yeah. Well, I think that's where this this issue that I raised toward the end on under what circumstances would we sort of dispense with the formalities of testing something properly and roll out a, a countermeasure. Of course, we have to have the countermeasure to roll out. Um, I think those sort of nightmare scenarios, whose probability I don't know how to estimate any better than, than anyone else, uh, except to say that we don't know of such, in the public domain, there is no evidence that such viruses exist. Um, uh, I think those nightmare scenarios are, are the ones where you have to think about what you would do uh, in terms of trying to roll out and test a, a countermeasure simultaneously. You still look like I'm not answering your question. <laughs> From the policy side, um, these are probably questions that SAPI looks at regularly uh, and also uh, how does it work if we have to test something and how do we protect patients as well? So the setting up of, com of a compensation fund is something that's being actively discussed at the World Health Organization. Uh, and h how do we handle it if there is a state of emergency and we do have to test or to use a vaccine without having gone through the full clinical trial? So if you're interested, uh, we can chat later on. One last question. Well, thank you very much, Mark. That was a very uh, interesting. We hope that the ring vaccination trial gets more conclusive as progress and you get your NIH grant soon. <laughs> thank you, thank everyone. You. And uh, we'll see you at the next event in January.